Hello guys, I'm back. My name is Jefferson Costa, I'm a chemical process engineer with expertise in plant design and today I am with Bruno Ferreira to talk about a little bit uh, about his career and also about sulfuric, acid sulfuric pro process. And it's very nice to have Bruno here, he is Brazilian and it's a pleasure to have a Brazilian with me and of course other countries, but it's not every day that I receive Brazilians here in my channel. So before we start, let us know where are you from. It's always very nice to know how rich, how far we reach people in the world. So Bruno, uh, good good morning here in Brazil. Good morning, Jefferson. Thanks for the invitation. It's very also very nice for me to be here with you and with everyone which is who is watching the video. Bruno, uh, I have some questions here. I have a. Uh, uh, questionnaire to help me to, to remind the questions that I have to you. And the first question that I would like to address to you is about your graduation, your graduation time. And could you tell us a little bit more about how was it for you? And I have seen that you was a director in a junior enterprise, Prisma, and how did it uh, help you in your career? Okay. Um... I studied chemical engineering in the university, uh, Federal University of Bahia. It is a, a university that is in Salva, it is located in Salvador, the capital of Bahia State in Brazil. It is a, a state uh, located in Northeast Brazil. So I have studied uh, for like five or six years chemical engineering there. And I had the opportunity also to uh, do a mobility program there was a, a, a Brazilian, a program uh, organized by the Brazilian government at the time called Science Without Borders. And with this, this program, I was able to study for one year in the US, so in the University of Minnesota. It was very nice. I was able to, to take some courses there on polymers, for example, on bioprocess engineering, which was very good. Uh, and when I came back to Brazil, I uh, finished my, my graduation and started my internship uh, in a petrochemical company. Uh, regarding to the junior enterprise, I don't know if we, we have uh, junior enterprises in all the countries, but in Brazil it is, it is very popular. It is an enterprise that is, is it's like a small company, consulting company, that is managed by the students with a professor super, supervising the, the job. And in the case of chemical engineering uh, at this university where I studied, uh, we had this company called Prisma Junior, and I worked there as a in the human resources area. So not a not very technical technically involved, but I, I really appreciated the the opportunity. It was good for me to to get to develop some soft skills, uh, get to know more about management, about leadership. It was good for me to see uh, what I would like to, to do in my career, what I would like for my future. So maybe to, to work in the, as a process engineer, but later on uh, work in some management positions. So it, it was a very good experience. I don't know if uh, we have junior enterprises everywhere, but here in Brazil, it's very popular. And it was a, a very good experience for me to develop communication and internet, uh, interpersonal relationship. So I, I would highly recommend it. Nice, nice to hear that. And let me tell you a secret. I am a chemical process engineer for formation, and I have a friend of the time from graduation that he becomes a human resource director. He left the technical <laughs> area and focused on. He was very good with people. He was the the kind of guy that was always uh, managing parties and something like that. So. I think that was a, a normal normal path for him to, to deal more with people and less, and less with technicians. But yeah. very nice when we have this kind of opportunity. And I have seen also in your LinkedIn profile that you, you, you get uh, some, some prizes and you, you could talk a little bit more about the Young Leaders Prize and also 3M event of a new future challenge, what, what is it? Uh, it is only in Brazil or do you know if other countries uh, can, students from other countries can get this kind of contest? How is it? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so first about uh, 3M, Invent a New Future Challenge. Uh, when I, in my last years of graduation, I was an intern at Braskin, a Brazilian company, in a polyethylene plant. And I was an intern in the process engineering field for two years. Very good experience as well. Uh, but in the end, uh, I didn't have a, an opportunity to stay there. Uh, th there were not uh, job opportunities in that uh, field. So I had to look for a job. And one of the ways of, of uh, getting to getting more exposure at, the exposure at the time was this challenge organized by 3M here in Brazil. Uh, actually, it was a global challenge, but you had a national step. And if you were the winner in this step, you would go to represent Brazil in the global part of the challenge. And I was this guy. Uh, the, the challenge was not related to chemical engineering. I mean, you, you had a selective process and then they selected, if I'm not mistaken, 10 or 12, I think it was 10 uh, students from all the country. And then you, you had like a three days uh, experience, like actually two days experience, uh, like an immersion, very immersive uh, experience. You, you received a, a, ch a challenge, uh, like a, a real company challenge and you had to build a business case in group and present mm -hmm. to them. And if you were the winner uh, or if you were one of the finalists, for example, you would, you would uh, like skip some steps in the trainee program uh, selection of this company. So my idea was to, to have a good um, result in this, in this competition to, be, to have more chances to maybe be a, a 3M employee at the time. I was looking for, for a job. Uh, and then the, the subject of the, the competition was the sustainable development objectives of, of um, how it is in English? ONU, uh, United Nations Organization, uh, UNO. So it was, I, I could use some of my background as a chemical engineer, but uh, I worked with people from management, from production engineering, that was very good. Uh, I was the, the, my group was the winner at the time and I received the prize of best uh, individual performance, let's say like mm -hmm. this. And then I, they sent me to the US, to the headquarters of 3M, which was in Minnesota, the same stage where I, I lived for one year during my university. And there, the challenge was regarding to diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. That was in 2017, I guess. And there, again, my group was the, the winner. And my group had people from South Korea, from Saudi Arabia, very, also very good experience to get to know people from other countries. And, and then I came back to Brazil. I, I tried the, the trainee program, but I, I wasn't approved. Uh, but I was not like sad or anything like this because the, the whole experience was very good. And soon I found uh, a job position in other companies. So, but the, the, that was uh, the, the 3M Invent a New Future Challenge. Mm -hmm. And regarding to Young Leader Prize, it was like another competition. Let's say, yeah, I would say it is a competition, but uh, it is more like a recognition prize for young people that is doing good things in the companies that is, um, they, they, they talk about intra uh, entrepreneurship. So it's like you being an entrepreneur in a, a private company, mm -hmm. not being a, a, a company owner or something like this. So I had to do, this happened this year, actually last year, 2020. I was already working at BSF, working as a process, process engineer. And then I, my leader supported me to send an application. It's like a letter saying all the things that I was doing, the projects that I was doing in, in the company and the impact of those projects. So I, I was doing a, a project related to energy efficiency, for example. I said that in the application. And then I was one of the 30 finalists and we had a whole weekend of uh, immersion uh, in leadership topics, in how to, to bring more change in the companies. And, and now I've, I am part of this community of young leaders and with some frequency we have meetings with, with uh, top management executives to share their experiences with us. So it's very much like um, leadership oriented, you know, not a technical 
both the experiences were not technical ones. Uh, I like to say that uh, you were a chemical engineer. You have to to know about technical stuff, but you are way more than this. You can you can go into other things, other experiences, exchange with people from other uh, curriculums, other backgrounds. It is always very positive. So that is is a little bit of those two experiences. About 3M Invent a New Future Challenge, I believe every year they have that. And Young Leader Prize as well, uh, every year they have that. So if you want to, if you're a Brazilian and you want to try both of them next year, this year, I think it is still a, a possibility. Very nice. And it is interesting because you were doing chemical process engineering and it is very technical. But as per, per my understanding, you get uh, a way for management path. But now you are a chemical process engineer in a, in, a, in a chemical company. How was this transition from the graduation to get your first job? And how the management uh, skills that you developed during your graduation in, in this experience helped you to get your first job. What do you think about that? Yeah, it is interesting because at first when you are in the university, uh, we used to think about the, the chemical engineers as rational, technical, you know, uh, most like we see our uh, teachers in the university, right? People that work with research all the time, uh, sometimes people that are hard to live with because they are very, I don't know, bossy or they are full full of knowledge and, you know, that, that kind of, of pattern, pattern you, you believe that all the chemical engineers are like that. And if you are not so much into technical things or analytical things, you think that, that it won't be a, a space for you in chemical engineering. And it's not true. Actually, when I, I was in the university and I liked a lot to work in the junior enterprise in the human resources area, I thought, okay, so maybe I have to choose uh, to work as a, a, in management positions or, or with human resources. I really liked that. Or I will work with um, process engineering. And at first, when I was in the junior enterprise, I thought my path would be human resources, for example. And then when I started my internship, uh, which was a two-year in two years internship with process engineering in a polyethylene plant. I loved that. Uh, I realized that my path would be in process engineering. I really liked uh, to, uh, how I could apply all the knowledge I got in the university in real life. But in the industry, I realized that they are not separate things. You know, we, as a process engineer, you you have your moment of analyze data, of do some project, of doing some projects. But you also have the moment to explain to your operators how how they are supposed to run the plant uh, or run that new project. You have to do presentations for upper management, so you have to talk the the in a way that is not hard for someone to understand. Because th that is also a thing. Sometimes uh, when you are in the in the university, you think that you are going to that you have to say things the, the hardest way you're using all the, the scientific terminologies all the time. But in the plant, you have the guys from supply chain, you have the guys from marketing, everyone will need logistics, everyone will need to talk, maintenance, everyone will need to talk to you. Most of them are not chemical engineers and you have to be able to translate that for them. So I really think that they are not separate things nowadays. Uh, for example, I've had leaders in the, places I worked uh, so far, that they were very good as engineers. So they understood uh, the concepts, the, the problems, the equipment, but they were also very good managers. So they would understand about cost control. They would understand about people, uh, management, uh, about the market uh, in which we, we were inserted. So they're not separate things. And uh, I don't, let me see if I remember... The, the, your question was mm, transition between graduation yeah, the transition. and first job. Yeah. So uh, when I finished graduation, I already had the had the experience of the junior enterprise and the internship in a plant as a process engineering intern. So I knew that I wanted to go in the technical path at least for a while. 
uh, to work as a plant engineer or a, a process engineer. Uh, but it was hard at the time to find job, find a job. Uh, I didn't find a job in the. I have tried a lot of processes, selective processes, but some, uh, most of them, I did not get good results. So that was a uh, four or five months looking for a job, and then I got this this interview through LinkedIn. That is very interesting. I I, I usually didn't had some, have much faith in LinkedIn as a, a recruitment platform. But my first job experience uh, as an engineer came uh, by through LinkedIn. So they called me to an interview in this metallurgical company here, also here in, in Bahia, in the state where I currently live, and uh, to work as a process analyst and in a sulfuric acid uh, plant. Mm -hmm. And that is where uh, I learned all of the things that I will share today about a, a sulfuric acid process. I worked there for one year and three months, and then I left to work at BSF, which is the company where I, I work today. So this transition was actually okay Okay for me. The, the bad part was to wait for some months without working or studying. For me, it was hard because uh, in the end of my graduation course, I was doing the internship, I was studying, I was writing my final project to the university. So I was with a lot of things in my head. And then for some months, I I was at home uh, subscribing to, to selective processes and receiving a lot of notes as answers. So this beginning was kind of hard. But then when I start, started in this uh, metallurgical company, I had a lot of challenges. I worked in the shift for for some months. So I got to, to know how it is the experience of an operator for example, a process operator. It was good, very good. I learned a lot. And also, I was in a metallurgical company, even though I was in a chemical plant, but I was in a metallurgical company. So it was very different from what I lived in the internship, which was a petrochemical company. So also very good learnings. Uh, very, very nice. And I, when you were talking, uh, some questions come to my mind. First, I would like to ask you, uh, did you apply to a, to a position that was available in LinkedIn or the recruiter get into to you uh, uh, at the first first time? Sometimes I am in the LinkedIn and, and I receive some The, the recruiter got recruiter. in touch with me. Got... Uh, okay, and you already, you, uh, although you didn't yeah. believe in, in LinkedIn, your profile was okay. How was your profile on that time? No, my, my profile was was very updated there. I, I, I mean, I didn't uh, believe in LinkedIn as a recruitment plat recruitment platform, but I I knew it was a very good platform for doing networking. So I was there more uh, more for the network than for actually getting a job position, and and it was a good surprise. So, but I always I always kept the LinkedIn profile updated. Uh, Focusing on, on networking, networking in my field of study in with other chemical engineers. Okay, nice. And another thing, you get one, one period without getting a job. Did you consider to do a master to fill this gap or no, your focus was, was always on getting a job? Yeah, I, I have uh, difficult feelings about doing a master's. I want to do so at some point of my yeah, life yeah, because yeah, yeah. I, no because because I want to to be a professor at some point uh, after I uh, when I'm very old and I leave the the, the I when I will be sick of industry uh, of waking up early every day and going to the the petrochemical complex. But when I remember the environment that I had in the university, I really don't like that. Uh, a lot of ego. Uh, a lot of professors, at least in my university, a lot of professors that were very disconnected from the the experience that we have in the industry. So I, I, I thought at the time, okay, it is a possibility, but uh, actually in Brazil, you know that sometimes there is a, a, no, a common knowledge, especially in the companies, that if someone has a, in, finishes the university and goes into master's or, or doctorates, uh, that this person wants to pursue uh, an academic career. So I was also afraid of this. It's it's not, um, it's silly, 
because uh, in Germany, for example, most of people that work even in marketing or management things uh, in, at BSF, they come from the university and they do and they did uh, graduation, masters, and and doctors and PhD all along, and and then they they look for job opportunities. But here in Brazil, I believe that there is this sense that either you go to work in the industry or you do a master's in a... So I didn't want that to define me as someone that wanted to pursue a research or uh, academic career because it was not the, the real true. Mm -hmm. So I, I waited for a little bit longer trying to look, trying to get a job. But I, I believe that at some point, if I, if I had like six months without finding anything, I would try to go in, in another path. But I was more open to work, for example, with logistics or with other uh, area in the industry than to go into the university again and, and do a, a thesis, those kinds of things. I was kind of sick of the university after five years there. <laughs> so I wanted to get some real, real experiences. Nice, very, very nice. And uh, talking about the job, you said that you got an opportunity as an analyst. And here in Brazil, it's kind of a lower grade when compared to engineering. And when yeah. we finish, most students when finish the graduation, they think that the, that we will get opportunity as in, an engineer because it, it has higher salaries. But sometimes the companies uses the analyst position to get a, a engineer, but not pay yeah. as an engineer. That was an issue for you, or what you were really interested was in the opportunity to start working, and it doesn't matter the the job title. Yeah, uh, second option. I was looking for an opportunity. I wanted to be in in the plant, uh, learning, working, uh, having responsibilities that I didn't have as an intern. You're right, it is very common here in Brazil. Let's see uh, the analyst position as an entrance position. It's like a trainee position. You will not have a, a, the, the wage of a, a, a process engineer or a junior engineer yet, but you are going to develop your skills, you are going to learn, and then at some point you will be promoted. And if you, if you are not promoted, you can look for another job, but the, the, the experience is very important. And I saw it like this because I had nothing. So when you have nothing, uh, it, whatever appears for you, if, if it is challenging, if you can learn something, uh, I believe you have to face it. So And, and things happened in the, the right time for me, I guess. I stayed for one year and, and three months there. And then I I came to another company to, to work as a junior engineer. Now I am a, what we call here a pleno engineer so like medium grade engineer let's say like like this uh, before being a senior engineer and i think uh, if you if you think too much about the money or you know of, of course you want to be recognized as an engineer but in the practice when you are an you are an analyst and you work in the plant you are a process engineer uh, what you do is what a process engineers do Sometimes you don't get paid like a process engineer, but I think it's a matter of time. Uh, and I, I think the most important in the beginning of the career is learning. Learning and uh, collecting histories to tell in interviews, collecting experience that you can share later when you find the ideal job for you, the one that you want. I, I totally agree with you. When I finished my graduation, also I took some time to get the first job. If you, uh, I expanded one year or one year and a half. And what I was uh, worried about getting the opportunity, if I could, I could uh, work for free for one year just to get the experience enough to show to the, to the market that uh, I have experience, I can help you and you cannot, you don't need to, to worry about teaching me things because now I know what I'm doing. And I think that's the, the way that the graduations must uh, pursue when they finish your graduation, take one or two years of experience uh, before thinking about increasing salary, change jobs. I think that's the best way to, you, to you build your career. 
And yeah. your first job was in a acid, uh, sulfuric acid company. And in fact, mm -hmm. this is the main of subject of this presentation, of this live session. And I know that yeah. you have a presentation to share with us, talking a little bit about this process, how is the, the operations issues and etc. So feel free to, to share your, your presentation. Okay, thanks Jefferson. Um, first of all, I, I, when, we, when you invited me to, to chat today, uh, I was very, I was thinking a lot because I have worked with very nice, I had the opportunity to work with four nice technologies uh, in my small career path. I worked with polyethylene, which is polymers. I worked with sulfuric acid and then with superabsorbent polymers, polymers again. And now I'm working with acrylic acid. Uh, but the, the technology of sulfuric acid is one of the most interesting ones because it is a very old technology actually. So people had time to optimize it a lot. So you have a lot of energy integration in this technology. You have a lot of interesting equipment and it's a very common process. You have sulfuric acid plants in almost every country in the world, especially if your country has a very good agriculture uh, market because uh, sulfuric acid goes a lot in, in fertilizers uh, process. So, and also it, since the technology is very old, you have a lot of content online about it. So you don't have uh, secret issues. Uh, so I would be able to share a lot of details with you. What one thing that I, I wouldn't be able to do to the other technologies that I have worked for. So just a, a quick, quick introductions. I will go through this presentation that I built, but if you guys have questions or Jefferson, if you have questions, feel free to, to interrupt. Okay. Okay. So here you can see a plant, uh, a sulfuric acid plant. A new one because when they get older, it's not that, be that beautiful because you have a lot of corrosion. It is a hard chemical to work with. Um, and here's a picture of uh, a sulfuric acid plant at BSF, the company which I work today, but in the site of Antwerp, which is located in Belgium. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, sulfuric. Let, let me, okay, just a second. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about sulfuric acid and a, a little bit about the marketing as well as an introduction. So sulfuric acid is, is it has this uh, appearance here of the molecule. Uh, it is a strong mineral acid and it's highly corrosive. So if you work with sulfuric acid, you have to take a lot of, you have to take care with it. Uh, it is a viscose liquid that's soluble in water and the color varies from yellow to colorless depending on the concentration. Uh, the outcomes of acrylic of acrylic of sulfuric acid uh, sulfuric acid goes in the production of a lot of things sometimes as a reactant sometimes as a catalyst uh, so it, you can produce hydrochloric acid nitric acid sulfate salts synthetic detergents dyes pigments explosives drugs a lot of things uh, with sulfuric acid so it, it's very it's a very important commodity chemical uh, the highest market share in 2017 was the fertilizers. So I believe that is also why uh, Brazil has uh, a lot of, of uh, sulfuric acid plants, because we have a very uh, strong agricultural tradition here in the country. Um, and how sulfuric acid goes into the fertilizers uh, market? It is used to produce some kinds of fertilizers, such as ammonium phosphate, ammonium sulfate, and also in the production of phosphoric acid. Major players today, we can say PVS Chemicals, BSF, ExoNobel, Dow DuPont, Unigel, Boliden, Ineos. So you have lots of players. Uh, when you have a fertilizer complex, uh, sometimes you, most of the times you have a sulfuric acid plant inside your complex. So you don't buy sulfuric acid uh, from other, other company. Uh, in my case, I worked in a metallurgical company. So the sulfuric acid plant was actually a, an environmental plant. It treated the off-gas of the furnaces and the production of sulfuric acid was a, 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 like a bonus. The idea was to really not send SO2 to the atmosphere. So that is also another uh, place where sulfuric acid plants can be, metallurgical companies. 
uh, as a side plant, let's say like this, as an environmental plant. Uh, the sulfuric acid market, uh, I, I got some reports online. Uh, the sulfuric acid market is estimated to reach 324 million tons by 2027. So if you look online about numbers of uh, basic chemicals production, you will realize that it is a lot of, of tons. So it is a very popular chemical. You use it a lot in the industry. And the market size was valued at $10 billion in 2016. And the expectation is that it grows and grows even more because the population is growing in the world and you have to, to feed those people. So all the, the chemicals related to agriculture that support agric agriculture, as f like a, such as fertilizers, uh, they are very relevant. So you will have an increasing uh, need for sulfuric acid uh, when you think that, when you realize that fertilizers is the highest outcome of sulfuric acid. So you've, you see here, uh, increasing through years, the, the demand, right? Uh, here, actually, you have the revenue, but you can read as the demand as well. Uh, and you see that fertilizers is the, you have almost 60% or 50 to 60% of the demand goes, is to, to attend fertilizers but you have also in chemical manufacturing, you have metal processing, petroleum refining, automotive, textile industry, and pulp and paper, okay? Here you have also some, a plot with this 50% uh, piece for a full state fertilizers industry. And moving forward, uh, one nice thing is that uh, Sulfuric acid is an important commodity chemical, and it is a good indicator of a nation's industri industrial strength. Because if your country has a lot of industries, it will have it will need a sulfuric acid plant. You, it's not a very expensive process, let's say, to to build from scratch. So you will prefer to to have your own production probably than to import from other countries. So. If you look at the companies that pro that are the the largest producers of acrylic acid, uh, like you will see China, United States, uh, so companies that has uh, that have also a strong industrial uh, performance that has a lot of industries that has a, a strong chemical industry, for example, or agricultural uh, uh, activities. And the main raw material sources that you have, uh, you can buy elemental sulfur, sulfur like you see here in this in this picture, burn it to produce SO2, and then you will go into your sulfuric acid plant. Or, for example, you can have uh, a smelter. A smelter is is like a big furnace. Uh, smelter companies are companies that uh, buy a concentrate of a mixture of a lot of heavy metals and a lot of chemicals, and they want to purify it to achieve uh, a high purity content of one of the chemicals. For example, I worked in a copper smelter. They bought a, a concentrate, and this concentrate had copper, arsenic, uh, think of all the, the uh, lead, uh, lead uh, all, think of all the heavy metals, you would have all of this mixed, but mostly you would have copper and sulfur. So the idea is to really purify this concentrate to get uh, pure copper. And the side effect would, would be the production also of SO2. And there, the sulfuric acid plant will enter to really purify, the, to, to uh, get this SO2, convert to sulfuric acid, and not send the SO2 to the atmosphere due to environmental regulations. So just for you to have a glimpse of how it is a a copper smelting uh, complex, you would have, you would receive the copper concentrate and then you'd have, you would have some furnaces. In those furnaces, you will expose this concentrate to very, very high uh, uh, temperatures and you will produce oxides from this elemental uh, metals. One of the oxides, uh, copper oxide, that it will that will follow here and go onto the, the last parts of the process to be like a slab of copper, uh, the refined copper with almost 100% purity. 
and that you will send to a lot of different industries, uh, most mostly construction industries, and in the future to build the electrical. Uh, not in the future, actually. Right now, you have a lot of uh, electrical cars. Uh, electrical vehicles uh, running uh, over there. Not that much in Brazil, but in other countries, yes, you have. And that is another company, that, that is another application that will require copper. So, uh, okay, but what do you do with those off gases from especially those two first furnaces? You have to treat them uh, before you send uh, away to the atmosphere. So, and that's why the sulfuric, that's where the sulfuric acid plant is located. So in the company where I worked, scenes like this in the picture uh, are common. You would have, uh, you have these furnaces and you have to remove the, the copper oxides from the furnaces. So you have this operator here. Uh, he would like uh, make a hole in the furnace and this, thing similar to lava, let's say like this, will come out of the furnace and it is rich in copper oxides. So you have a more purified copper here in this phase uh, inside the furnace. So just to, to, to give you guys a, an idea, but our focus today will be on, on the sulfuric acid plant uh, more specifically. Okay, so the, the process that I, I brought to for you guys today is the contact process. That is, is the more recent technology, but it's not that recent. We have developments of this technology in that come like from more than 100, more than 100 years. So the process was first patented in 1831 by a British vine vinegar merchant uh, it was more economical than the previous technology because, yeah, you, you have a previous technology before this time to produce sulfuric acid. And the, the previous technology was uh, called lead, uh, lead chamber. But uh, when, you got, when you start developing catalysts for this technology, uh, it increased a lot in scale also. So in 1901, there was a guy that patented a process involving vanadium oxides as catalysts. And this process was superseded by another process that was invented by two chemists of BASF in 1914. So that's why you find a lot of information about sulfuric acid technology online, because technology comes from more than uh, 100 years uh, ago. Uh, okay, so the reaction that is most important in this process is it's not the reaction actually that produces sulfuric acid. That, that, is, that is a simple one, but this one is the this one is the most important. The conversion of SO2 uh, to SO3 in the presence of uh, oxygen. So you have an oxidation reaction here, and it's also an equilibrium reaction. We will talk about this uh, later on. Also, it's important to know that it is a highly exothermic reaction. So in a lot of uh, plants, you will use this heat, some of this heat. Actually, in all of the, the plants, you will use this heat to do some energy integration. But uh, when you buy uh, elemental sulfur, you don't get the SO2 from the, the furnaces. When you buy uh, elemental sulfur, you will burn it to convert to SO2. And in that case, you can have, for example, a boiler to also generate steam. So that is also another outcome of, of a sulfuric acid plant. You can uh, generate steam with it if you have that this other kind of technology which burns elemental sulfur not, and not use uh, metallurgical off gases. So some remarks on this technology, this contact technology. Uh, it is, I would say, simple when you compare to a steam cracker, for example, to other to petrochemical processes that are more complex because of separation uh, uh, complexities. Uh, so here you have few raw materials. Basically, you just need oxygen and a sulfur source to generate the SO2. And basically, it's just that and, and cooling water let's say, with the three of them and electricity as well. So four things and you can have yours in the catalyst. So five things now, but still a few things compared to other, comp other technologies. Uh, 
Uh, it is, as I said, also you have few equipment, so you don't have like super big plants uh, to produce sulfuric acid. It is a well-established technology. So you, we know a lot about it. Uh, there are a lot of uh, websites online and a lot of meetings worldwide to discuss this technology, to discuss further improvements in this technology. So through time, this technology has improved a lot. And now you are, you are going to see that it is very integrated. It is uh, that that made this technology very economic. Uh, also, you have a high energy and material integration. So you throw very few things away uh, in terms of residues, wastewater, very few. And also you use a lot of the energy that is generated by the reactions to heat other parts of the process that you want to heat. So that is also a very interesting thing about this, pro this process. Uh, also, there is a lot of work ongoing uh, on catalyst development because the environmental regulations are getting more and more um, strict worldwide. So those pro this, uh, the highest you get the conversion of SO2 to SO3 and then to uh, sulfuric acid, the less you are going to emit of to the atmosphere of SO2. And the regulations ask for less and less of those SO2 regulations due to environmental concerns. Uh, so uh, you have a lot of catalyst development to bring this conversion to almost 100%. So we will uh, send to the atmosphere the less amount possible of SO2. Okay. Uh, also, what are the main what are the main challenges when you work in a sulfuric acid plant? You have to look all the time on the integrity of your equipment, because corrosion is a problem. Uh, at some point, at some parts of, as I said, sulfuric acid is very co corrosive, but it's even more corrosive when it is in lower concentrations. Which is, I mean that to equipment, okay? Corrosive to equipment. Uh, when you have lower concentrations and when you have higher temperatures. So if you have a point here where you have a lower concentration of sulfuric acid in a higher temperature, you have to take care of the materials that you choose to your, to your equipment. On the other hand, when you have very high concentrations of sulfuric acid, the problem is more uh, to the people who work with the in the plant. Because if you have a leak, if you have a spew, uh, people can get hurt, can get burned actually, uh, severely hurt because of the the characteristics of this this uh, the sulfuric acid so that brings some personal uh, safety aspects for you to look at how will be the ppe the 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 personal equipment that your operators are going to use for example when they will take a sample or when they are doing maintenance in, in a, some part of the plant cleaning the plant so you have to take care of this also, process safety. You don't want uh, sulfuric acid leaking and going to to the ground uh, because it can contamine the the water that is underground. Uh, and also, you have to concern about transportation because if a, a truck, for example, full of sulfuric acid uh, falls in, in a in a road, uh, and that sulfuric acid can kill animals, for example, or can go to a river, that, then you have a very big problem. So that is also a very particular aspect of uh, sulfuric acid process, sulfuric acid plants. Also, it's very intensive on cooling water because you produce the sulfuric acid at high temperatures and you commercialize it at around 30 degrees, uh, 25 degrees, uh, in, uh, normal temperature, ambient temperature. So you need to cool down, uh, remove all the heat that this reaction uh, can generate. Okay. So far, Jefferson, any questions from your side or, or from people that is watching us? No, Bruno, you can proceed. I will keep my question for the, for the end, okay? To you not uh, okay. your, your assassin. No problem. So let's get into more details on the, the technical part, the equipment, and how to recognize a sulfuric acid plant if you find one in your path. Uh, here we have a picture of a very new sulfuric acid plant. In, uh, it is in Saudi Arabia. I will talk more about this project in the end because it is the largest uh, sulfuric acid facility 
in the world nowadays, if I'm not mistaken. At least five or, or six years ago, it was still the, the largest one, uh, the lar largest facility. Uh, here, you can see right in front of you the converter. That is the catalytic converter that will convert SO2 to SO3. You have a lot of side equipments, mostly heat exchangers and absorption towers. I will show them more in detail in the next slides. So let's go through a, a, a flow chart of a, a sulfuric acid process. This one I got in the website of Dupont. Dupont has a is a, one of the uh, one of the technology licensors for sulfuric acid. Their their technology they called Max. And so let's go here. Uh, when you when you burn sulfur, you will have this process gas which is the, the SO2, very clean. So we won't need like a very big uh, uh, purification section in your process. But when you, you go, when you are in metallurgical uh, companies and you, you have that SO2 coming from the furnaces with a lot of heavy metals, such as arsenic that is volatile. So it, it has vapors together with the SO2 source. Then you have to really have big equipment to clean this SO2 because inside the converter you need to have first of all a dry gas and you have to to have mostly SO2 and O2 all the other things you have to try to remove it before going into this process here so uh, aside the the purification process let's start with the gas those SO2 source already clean let's say like this then you have to dry it. You enter the process gas into a, a, in a drying tower. This drying tower will dry the SO2 gas with strong sulfuric acid. So you won't need any solvent or anything like this. The sulfuric acid that you produced in the, fur, in the next steps of the process, you bring it back, what, a part of it, you bring it back here and you will wash this gas with strong sulfuric acid. Why? Because sulfuric acid is very hygroscopic. That's why, for example, it burns your skin. It will remove the, it will remove the heat from, uh, sorry, it will remove the water from your skin. And also this dilution generates heat. So it will not only dry your skin, but it will burn you with the heat that it will generate with increasing temperature. And so the, the sulfuric acid technology uses this hygroscopic uh, characteristic of sulfuric acid to use it in the first stages of the process. You have SO2 with some moisture coming in. You will wash it. You have here some distributors. You will wash it with strong acid. The strong acid will absorb the water and come to this storage tank with a lower concentration of sulfuric acid because you absorb it water. So now you are diluting a little bit your sulfuric acid, and the gas will come out here as a dry SO2 gas. Here in the top of the, the drying tower, you will have some candles. Those candles are similar to mist eliminators. The idea here is that you don't have, if your gas is coming too fast, for example, that it won't bring droplets of acid uh, to the top. So here you will retain the, the droplets here in the column, and you will pass the dry SO2 gas to the next stages, okay? Also, be, why, also, why is it important for you not to have droplets of sulfuric acid coming with your SO2 gas? Because you have a blower here. So if you have sulfuric acid coming with the gas at high temperatures into your blower, you can have serious corrosion problems uh, in your blower. So, here, you must receive the gas as dry as possible, the driest as possible. Okay, after this, you ha we have to increase a little bit more the temperature of the SO2 gas before, uh, sorry, we have to, to adjust the temperature of the, the SO2 gas to come into the first bed of the converter. The converter is, is a catalytic converter, so you have solid catalyst uh, reacting with SO2 gas to generate SO3 gas. So you don't have liquids here inside, only gas in the catalytic, in the catalyst as a solid. Uh, but you don't have like one big 
a catalyst bed. You have four catalyst beds to increase your conversion. We will get more details about that in the next slides. But then you will uh, prepare the temperature of the your, you will give some temperature to your SO2 income before entering the reactor. So this gas will pass through the shell of those two gas-gas heat exchangers, not by the tubes, not through the tubes, but through the shell. Uh, and then it will enter the first uh, bed. Uh, in the first part of this reaction, you have almost like 60% of conversion here, and we, you will generate a lot of heat. You have to remove the, the, the stream, and you have to cool it down. And how do you cool it down? By heating the stream that was entering the first bed. So here you have already some energy integration because all this, this reaction heat that you had here, uh, at least most of them, you will transfer to the stream that is arriving, right? That is coming into the, the reactor, to the first stage. Sometimes it's, it's a little complex to understand this, but if you follow the, uh, the lines, uh, you won't have much problem. But in the plant, it is very hard to identify that because you see a lot of ducts. I will show you guys in, in some pictures later. Okay, so you leave the, the first bed. You, you cannot achieve too much high temperatures here in the first bed because you can uh, cause damage to your catalyst. And then your catalyst will lose activity. So that is also a thing that you have to look at all the time. How is your catalyst uh, working? Is it still active? Because if it is not, you will have problems with your emissions in the end of the process. Okay, so after coming here through the tubes of the gas-gas heat exchanger, it will come back to the second bed. It will react a little bit more. And then you have here, you go to another heat exchanger to cool it down. You come here to the third bed, you will react a little bit more. Here you have already almost 90% conversion overall. So you will leave here, you go to another heat exchanger. And then after the third bed, you go already to an absorption tower. In this absorption tower here, you, as I said, you have almost 90% conversion of SO2 to SO3. So you mostly have SO3 and you have a little bit of SO2 in the gas. What do you do? you pass it through a, an absorption tower. And the absorption tower will wash this gas, but not, not anymore with strong acid. It will wash the gas with not that strong acid, with like 95, 96%, because it will absorb the SO2 and it will leave the absorption tower as a high concentration gas. And that is your product. That is your product that you're going to send to your customer. So, in the end, we are going to analyze here, but you have a, mat a material integration because you have high concentration acid, not that high concentration acid, and you, you use the, the medium concentration acid to dry the, in this column, and you use the not that much concentration acid to absorb the SO2, the SO3, sorry, from the, that is generated in the reaction to turn it into sulfuric acid, because remember, sulfuric acid is SO3 plus water. Here, the, the way it works, it's very similar to the drying tower. So we will wash this SO2 plus SO3 gas inlet. You will generate acrylic acid, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, sulfuric acid in the bottom, and you will leave with a more pure SO2 stream here. And as this SO2 stream, just a second. Sorry. Uh, and then you will come back with this SO2 stream that here you have the SO2 that was not reacted. It will come back to the last stage of the process. After the last stage of the process, you will come here, exchange heat again, and then you will go to the final absorption tower. And what, whatever leaves here as the exhaust gas goes to the atmosphere. So here you have an analyzer and you have to know how much SO2 it's leaving here. If it is high, you sometimes you have to stop your plant because you are not licensed to send all this amount to the atmosphere. Moreover, if you have communities living next to your, your plant, 
uh, when you when this amount of SO2 increases a lot, people start to feel the smell of SO2, and it's very irritating. Uh, so you have to take care of this. And this amount here that is not reacted, that leaves of SO2, is completely related to the performance of your catalyst. Okay, because you have to to achieve the highest conversion as possible. Um, okay. Associated uh, with the the absorption towers, which are the the with these towers, you have tanks, and those tanks have pumps submerged inside the tanks. Why is that? Because uh, you don't want uh, if you have problems with sealing in your pump, you don't ha you don't want to have sulfuric acid leaking in your plant. So you can let the pumps the pumps submerged. And you will avoid a, such a problem, okay? But of course, you have to take care of the material of your pump because it has to. It will be uh, in a sulfuric acid bath, okay? Uh, also, after you in those tanks, uh, and also I will show you some pictures of those tanks. You have sometimes you have to you have to put some brick lining inside your tanks uh, with bricks that resist to to acid because also you don't want to have leaks on those tanks. Okay, you don't want to have holes there or corrosion occurring here. And before sending to your customer, you have to pass through an acid cooler, a heat exchanger, and that's where you have a high uh, cooling water consumption because you don't want to send uh, hot sulfuric acid, hot and concentrated sulfuric acid to your tank farm or to your customer or to your, the truck. Okay, so yeah, I, I know that Maybe it is still some a little bit confusing. I will show you some pictures so you can see how it is in the in real life. But Jefferson, did you did you get any questions so far on the flow chart or on the overall scheme of the process? Do you know what kind of material is used in the equipment, the major ones? Yeah, uh, it depends on where whether you are sulfuric. You are in a part of the process with highly uh, concentrated sulfuric acid or not that much concentrated. If it is highly concentrated, uh, which means not much water, you can use, for example, stainless steel. Mm -hmm. It resists. But if you are in a part of the process with a weaker acid, uh, it is worst, or, or a hotter with higher temperature acid, it is worst to materials. So sometimes you use uh, materials similar to plastics, uh, I believe you can use PP, for example, in some some equipment, uh, some metal alloys with uh, it's like a, a more fortified uh, stainless steel, let's say like this. I don't remember much of the names, but something like this. Also in DuPont's website, uh, they talk about one material they have. I, I don't remember the, the name now, but the, there is also some development on materials uh, in this segment to, to make those equipment more reliable. But again, it depends on the characteristic of in the part of the process. If you are the sulfuric acid, the, it is worst for equipment if it is less concentrated and if it is uh, hotter with higher temperatures. So that, that will depend. Yeah. Okay. Although we are talking about high temperatures, the, the pressure is just enough to, to surpass the pressure drop, right? Yeah, yeah. That's why, for example, you call it here a blower and not a compressor, because you will, this process won't... Uh, it, it is also economic, right, when you have a process that don't have a very high pressure. Uh, so also uh, that is one thing that brings some economy to, to your process. But you have high temperatures. So here you have this, those beds, this reaction occurs at around 400 degrees Celsius. So very, very hot. And you have to send your product at like 30 degrees, 25 degrees. So you have a lot of heat to remove. Okay. 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 So let's go to see some pictures and some equipment in this industry. As I said, in this last uh, flow chart, you don't have a purification section here because I wanted to show a process uh, that is more similar for both kinds of, of sources, both from metallurgical sources and for sulfur burning, elemental sulfur burning processes. But in metallurgical, 
processes. You have to build a structure to some equipment to purify your process gas before entering uh, the process. Uh, and pur as purifying, I say, remove arsenic, remove uh, lead, remove nickel, remove chromo chromium, because all those things come with your gas. So here you have uh, one purification section picture. Uh, almost all the time you have uh, scrubbers and what, how those scrubbers work. So we will come here with the dirty gas and you will wash this dirty gas and uh, some of the companies that are volatile, but they are uh, soluble uh, in this liquid, this, this uh, stream that you are feeding here. Uh, they can, uh, the idea for you that you have is to solubilize the things that you want to remove for your stream. And that way you are going to, to be able to separate. So you come here with the dirty gas, you will wash this dirty gas. And when it enters here in this um, column has to be very large and, and tall because you have to give residence time to those, to this gas liquid. Uh, it's almost like a spray mixture for the droplets to settle. So the droplets will come here to the bottom and the gas will leave on the top. Even though it is very high, uh, uh, it's very tall and very large, some of the, the, the droplets can be carried away with the gas. So you, usually you have a demister here. So a mesh pad to really make those droplets adhere and uh, fall down. Okay, come back. So that is, a, uh, you have scrubbers in a lot of different planes, a lot of different technologies, not only sulfuric acid, uh, but that is how it works, okay? Other very, in this one, I, I believe it's more unusual, maybe a lot of you guys don't know this. It is a uh, electrostatic precipitators. So I had some of those in the company where I worked you will see them like this in the plant. How does it work? So it is based on an effect called corona effect. Uh, the corona effect says, says that when you have, a, for example, a gas flow, uh, and, it, and this gas flow has some particles that can be electrified, uh, uh, not electrified, but uh, that has electrical charges. Uh, for example, metals, metals, uh, has this have this characteristic. If you pass it this gas through tubes and you submit those tubes to a high uh, uh, electrical field, uh, you can make those metal particles to go to the walls of this tube. And then the gas will clean we will exit cleaner. So you have those equipments here, very tall and very big equipments. Uh, you have lots of tubes. So here in the vertical direction, you have a lot of tubes here. And if you look at those tubes from up, uh, from the top, you will see here the tubes and the walls. And you will, you will put a very high uh, energy uh, charge. You will uh, put a very high electrical field or you submit those the system to, to high voltages and you will adhere the the metal particles uh, that you could not that were not volatile for example and you were not able to remove in the scrubber here you will be able to remove so uh, and after that this this after you pass the gas you will wash put some liquid to wash this those walls and you will have a waste water with uh, those metals dissolved let's say like this Okay, so I don't know if it is clear, but it's not actually very complex. Uh, take a look at the corona effect and you will understand better how it works. But it's very interesting equipment. I, when I was doing some research, I realized that other industries, I believe that pulp, uh, pulp and, and paper use that uh, also, but it is very common in, in sulfuric acid plants. Okay, leaving the purification section, uh, and going to the conversion section, you you have uh, SO2 blowers. So here is a picture of uh, a blower. It's a, uh, normally they are centrifugal, 
blowers, okay? And they are very big. Depending on the size of your plant, they can be very big. And then we go to the reaction and the converter. So it is very interesting. Here's a picture of inside of one sulfuric uh, SO2 converter. So you will see here in the, the bed with a lot of small particles of catalysts. Uh, and the idea is that the, the gas will go here, come here from the top and it will flow from top to down from the top to the bottom here and pass through the catalyst and then leave the, the reactor. So this contact between uh, the, this contact surface between the gas and the, the catalyst is very important. So which are the most common catalysts? Uh, most common is vanadium oxide supported on silica. Uh, and sometimes in some beds that you, that you want a, some specific characteristics for the, the reaction, you can also add cesium uh, sulfate as a promoter, okay? This reaction, as I said before, is very exothermic. Uh, and the, the, I said, as I said, it is a very old technology, but you have a lot of development on catalysts. What, what, what do you look for when you develop the catalyst? You want to have a better uh, activity. You want to have better uh, conversions, but you also want to have lower pressure drop. And you can do that uh, for the activities based on the composition of the catalyst, the recipe to, to, build, to design it, and to the lower pr pressure drop, you can work on the size and the shape of the catalyst. So uh, you see here different uh, types of shapes. Uh, you have this uh, daisy one. It, this, this one is called daisy. Uh, it is very common. So uh, you are able to use the most of the surface of the catalyst to, to have more reaction, but also you want to put some holes not to build a very high pressure drop. Because in this case, you can, uh, your blower will have to work more. And sometimes you can even identify this bed, like build a hole in this bed. And that also would not be very good. You would have to shut down your plant to, to, to solve it. Also, with time, this catalyst, it starts to break and to, to generate some dust. So from time to time, you have to open, inspect the, your, to, you have like a, a shutdown to open, inspect all the beds, uh, look for if you have too much broken uh, catalyst inside, and then you remove and you replace with fresh catalyst. So that is a, a common routine in, in shutdowns of sulfuric acid plants, okay? Also, your catalyst don't support temperatures higher than 625. So the most preoccupied, you have to be preoccupied with your first bed because your first bed has a high conversion. Almost 60% of the reaction, the overall reaction happens, uh, the overall conversion happens in the first bed. So the first bed will heat a lot inside. We have a lot of heat inside. You cannot let it get to 625. Otherwise you will damage your catalyst. Okay, I told that with higher conversion, you can have lower emissions in, go, to the atmosphere. And some suppliers of catalyst, uh, uh, catalyst for this reaction, Howder Topsoy, BSF, and also Dupont. Okay. Uh, here it's the, the shape of the, how you, you would see from inside the, the reactor. Okay, moving forward. And that is the, the look of your converter in a sulfuric acid plant. I, I use it to, to think that it looked like an octopus or something like this. A lot of hints uh, uh, leaving the, the reactor. Those, all this, those ducts, and when you are building a sulfuric acid plant, the high, the, you see that they are very uh, large ducts and very, uh, the length is very high. So this is a very uh, important uh, factor to the cost of your installation. So the closer you can get those, those, heat ex this, those gas gas exchangers to your reactor, uh, the, the lower your cost is in, in ducts, uh, it is good for your, your project. And here, well, for you guys that remember the, 
the kinetics uh, classes in the university, if you remember, we have uh, Le Chatelier's principle, right? When you talk about uh, equilibrium reactions. So when a settled system is disturbed, it will adjust to diminish the change that has been made to it. What we can learn from that in, a, in this kind of reaction? How can we have gas here? So uh, we can look at pressure, for example. When you enter with SO2 and O2 and you generate SO3, you will tend to reduce your pressure inside because you will go from three, if you sum up here, you will go to uh, three moles to two moles. So that is one consideration. Also, you will increase your temperature because it is an exothermic reaction. And with, when you advance in conversion, you will start to have more products than uh, reactants. So how can you use Le Chatelier's principle to, to help you achieve higher conversions? First of all, don't make the reaction all in one bed. And that's why we have four beds. Because between the beds, what we do? We reduce temperature. So Le Chatelier says, Le Chatelier says that when you have an exothermic reaction, the more you remove the heat of the reaction from the system, the more your balance will be shifted to the formation of products. So that is one thing. That is why you remove the heat in, in all those exchanger, heat exchangers here. Other thing, the more you have, uh, raw, the more you have uh, in this mixture of raw materials and product, the more product you have, more the, the balance will be shifted to the reactants. So you don't want that because otherwise you will react and then you will unreact. You will uh, you produce your product and then you will come back to produce raw materials. So what is another uh, smart thing to do is when you have higher conversions in the beds that you have high, con after you have a high conversion and you have a lot of SO3, you remove that SO3 and come back to the reactor with a more reactant richer stream, let's say like this, with more SO2. So uh, uh, also you have to look at the the... Uh, ratio between O2 and SO2. You have to, to they have some, I, think, I believe it's 1.2 of air to two for SO2, I'm not sure, to, to one of SO2. But I mean, what I, what I meant is, why is the process designed like this? To use Le Chatelier's principle. You want to remove heat and you want to remove SO3. And that's how you are able to achieve almost 100% conversion. Because in the first bed that I said that builds more temperature because you have a, a higher conversion, when you achieve uh, 620, 630 degrees, you have to remove your, your mixture from that, right? Because you, otherwise you will damage your catalyst if you cross this boundary here in yellow. Also, this blue line is the equilibrium curve. So after this point, after 60% conversion in the first bed, you won't have any more, any more uh, conversion because the system will reach equilibrium and it will like freeze in this condition. And that's why you remove it to send to the other bed. In the other bed, and then before you go to the second bed, you will first cool down. So you cool down, cool down it a little bit. And put in the second bed. In the second bed, you have some more reaction until like 85, 89%. Then you reach equilibrium curve again. You have to remove heat. So you remove heat and you put it back here again. So in this plot, it is clear for us why the design is like this. Okay, so we can achieve the higher conversion as possible by removing SO3 and by removing heat. The removal of heat is through the gas-gas heat exchangers, and the removal of SO3 is using the absorption towers, okay? Because here you will remove part of the product and come back to the reactor with a uh, stream richer in uh, reactants, in non-reacted uh, SO2, okay? Uh, ah, and one important thing, when you, you look for technologies of sulfuric acid, sometimes you will find a description like this, DA3 plus one. What does it mean? Double absorption. So you have two absorption towers, three plus one. The first one is located after the third bed. And the second one, the final one is located after the fourth bed. So between the third and the fourth, you will have 
a uh, removal from the conversion section to the absorption section, and then come back to the conversion uh, section with less SO3, more SO2, okay? Um, okay, and how we remove heat? We remove heat through gas-gas heat exchangers. Here you ha here we have a, a, a picture. You have an idea of the temperatures, for example. So you will always enter your bed, enter your reactor with around 400 degrees Celsius. And so the idea is that always you will leave the beds with high temperatures, and then we you have to cool down to this approximately 400 degrees temperature, and then you come back inside. And how it is, uh, how a gas gas heat exchanger works? It's very, it's not very complex. It is a shell and tube heat exchangers, but usually vertical ones. Uh, and you will have a, a stream that is richer in SO3 going in the tubes and a streamer that is richer in SO2 and is co uh, it is colder going in the shell, okay? Uh, yeah, and that is for all the, the four of them that you see here. How it is uh, real life, right? Uh, you have basically like this. So similar to the picture, you have a lot of tubes, very small tubes. And this, you have very challenging logistic uh, aspects when you build a, a plant big like that. But it, in, from the inside, it's just like this. One thing that you have to take care, if your product leaves the absorption towers to come back to the reaction and you let droplets of acid, sulfuric acid concentrated uh, with the gas, it will be a problem because you can uh, corrode tubes, the tubes in the heat exchanger. So here you also have those candles to remove the mist, okay? To, to have this, this gas here the driest as possible. So you, that is another thing you have to always look at. How are the efficiency of those heat exchangers? If you have leaks here, you will see a loss of efficiency, okay? Okay, and uh, oh, here it is, uh, after you close it, you need to have all those equipment here to put it in place. And here is that looking at a sulfuric acid plant from the top. So you see here that the absorption towers are, and also the drying tower is all together in one part. And you have the converter with all the, the gas gas heat exchangers close to it. And you have a lot of ducts uh, because of all that path that we, we followed with the lines in the flow chart. So that is the view from the top. So here are the, the points. And he, he, we, you, you always have a stack as well because after the final absorption tower, uh, the SO2 that is not reacted goes to the atmosphere through the stack. Okay, some improved, improved designs for the converters. So nowadays you have, converters have uh, evolved to a setup that has some of the gas exchangers inside the, the converter. That way you can have an economy on ducts because you don't have that structure with a lot of ducts leaving and coming back to the to the converter, which also can lead, lead to leakage of gas through the atmosphere if you have corrosion, for example. So uh, this way you can enclose the, some of the exchangers inside the reactor. Here is uh, the process of building, uh, putting one reactor in place. Uh, and here is the design, the layout inside when you have uh, an internal heat exchanger. We are approaching the end. Uh, now about the absorption towers, how they work. So you will have inside, the gas will come here from the bottom, we will enter in the bottom and it will go up. Here you have packing because you want to maximize the contact between the gas and the liquid that is washing this gas. The liquid comes inside through distributors. So here you can see how those distributors look like. And in the top, after this, this gas is washed, you pass through the candles to ensure that you don't have mist or you don't have uh, droplets going with your gas uh, leaving the top, okay? 
here you can see from the bottom of a, a, an absorption tower the, the packing inside. And here you can see the candles, okay, in the top. Okay, as I said, after the, the absorption towers, you produce the acid, but it is hot. Uh, you, you store it inside the tank, and this tank has to, to be built with some bricks inside to resist corrosion to, and to protect the shell of the equipment of the tank. And uh, before you send to, to storage or to transportation, you have to ensure that it is colder. It is not like 100 degrees Celsius. You have to go to around 30 degrees, something like this. And then you, you will have the traditional heat exchangers that you guys already probably already know. Also shell and tube. You use a lot of cooling water. The stream here, this pipe is, is cooling water stream. And it is a shell and tube. So you can see here how it is in the inside. Uh, also, you have to take a lot of care with corrosion on these tubes. So you, you cannot let your concentration of, of acid fall before sending to storage because the less concentrated the acid, the more corrosive to, to materials. So if you have a uh, hole in one of those tubes, two things can happen and both of them are bad. First of all, if your pressure in the cooling water side is lower, you will send acid to your cooling tower. That is problem. That's why you monitor your the pH of your cooling tower all the time. Uh, even in, in usually the cooling towers of sulfuric acid plants are dedicated to the sulfuric acid plants. They don't feed other systems in the in the site, also because of this. And uh, if the pressure of your cooling uh, water is higher. Also, another bad thing can happen. You can uh, throw water inside your acid, and then your acid will be less concentrated, and it will be high corrosive. So you have more and more holes. And so when you realize that there is some leakage, uh, some uh, hole corrosion in one of those heat exchangers, you have to stop your uh, process to shut down your plant immediately to fix it. And every shutdown, you have to inspect, do some tests like add current, for example, on these tubes to see if they are losing, uh, I forgot the name in English, if they are losing espessura. Do you remember espessura in English, uh, Jefferson? Thickness. Thickness, okay, thanks. Okay, and to end, I will show you a, a very nice picture of the Maiden Phosphate Company uh, project that started up in 2010 in Saudi, uh, I believe it is in, yeah, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it, the technology is from a licensor called Autotech uh, and the construction was from a company called Gamma International. So this site, the, this company produces uh, fertilizers and they built a very large, the, the largest sulfuric acid complex with three plants, each plant with a capacity of 4,500 uh, tons per day. Uh, that would give per day the whole complex uh, 13,500 tons per day. So it is a lot. You see that here you can see, for example, one of the converters here, also another one here. You can see some things. Yeah, but they haven't brought here. You have. You can see here one of the, the gas gas heat exchangers. I have another picture. Here, yeah, you can see the building of the the absorption towers. Yeah, and here that that picture that I show you from the top. So here you have the converter, the the exchangers, the absorption towers, and when you need a purification section, uh, in the case of, for example, a, a metallurgical process, you can build here in that part the purification section. Yeah, that's it. So sorry if it was too long, but uh, I had some a lot of pictures to share with you to, for you to see how it is in, in real life. Uh, and thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Jefferson, do you have some further questions or the guys at home? Not yet, but we have some lag between your presentation and the, the people that you, is watching us. Mm -hmm. uh, very good presentation and excellent 
for sure, with many details on, on, on the equipment, on the process, and I, I am very impressed, for sure, Bruno. Uh, congratulations about the presentation. And based on your experience in the sulfuric acid and now with other process, how is the challenges of the chemical process engineers in the productions of such products? The changes you mean, like adjustments that we did, that we do in the day-to-day -day work. Yeah, the How challenges. Is work? What, what's ah, the, the challenges. Point? Okay, yes. the, the challenges. Yeah, it is very te technical-wise. It is very specific for the type of technology. So, as I said, uh, from a technical perspective, when you are in a sulfuric acid plant, you have to learn, understand about materials. You have to understand about the corrosion process, how how it builds, how it works. Uh, let me just stop sharing for a while. So you have to to learn about the risks of the the product that you are uh, producing, uh, and you have to take care of the operators that are in closer contact with it. Those are some of the technical aspects. But in my case, also, I had to learn about metallurgical processes because I had to understand the characteristic of the my raw materials. But I, I believe the 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 higher challenges, the, the most difficult challenges we can face in every plant, in every technology. Uh, people, you have to, to have a good communication, you have to solve problems in day-to-day -day routine, you have to be, you have to be able to uh, transfer the knowledge that you have from other people and respecting their backgrounds, respecting uh, their experience. So, I believe the, the most difficult and for me, the most exciting challenges of working as a process engineer in the plant is actually uh, the communication. It is synergy. It is to how for you to lead the team to make everyone work uh, following the procedures, working uh, to, uh, through the same in order to achieve the same objective, the going to the same direction. So I would say you have technical challenges, but those you study and then you learn. Uh, and with time, you are going to learn. Uh, and you have also the the personal challenges or the the soft the soft skills challenges that you have to to make some effort to to tackle to learn how to handle uh, in the day to day routine. So I would say this. I have some questions coming, and let me uh, read for you. The first one is from Javid. And guys, if you can tell us where are you from, it's very nice to know. So the Javid questions, in fact, there is two questions. I will read the first one, okay? Uh, how do you usually inspect corrosion in the plant as it has a very highly toxic environment? How is the inspection? How is the procedure to do the inspection of the plant? Yeah, um, you can have, you have some signals that you, you, as I said, for example, in the, uh, the heat, the acid coolers, for example, if you monitor the pH of your cooling tower, uh, if your pH drops very quick, it means that you are sending acid there. Of course, that there is the, a very bad scenario you are being you are being reactive when you use this this kind of approach after the problem happens you see it but what you can do is to really follow the the operation procedures so uh, make sure through for example uh, lab analysis that in your tanks you have acid in the the right concentration and that will decrease the chance of, of corrosion. You can monitor all the, the, the heat balance in your system, uh, uh, the in energy integrations, uh, are, are they working well? Are they working properly? So uh, you, you, you have a lot of signs that you can detect, but a good practice is every year during the shutdowns, you will open everything you will check, you will perform some tests in the tubes of the heat exchangers. You will do, for example, you, there are some pressure tests that you can do in the gas gas heat exchangers to see if it, uh, if it is, if you have some leakage. Um, let's say when you, when you also, if you monitor the temperatures 
of your converter, you can notice if your catalyst is in a good shape or not. And then when you have the shutdown, you can enter in the reaction, inspect, take a look, or enter in the absorption tower, take a look in the condition of the bricks, for example, that protect from corrosion. So it's very, it's very subjective. You have a lot of tests that you can do to detect, as I said, adequate tests, uh, some hydraulic, uh, hydraulic tests in some heat exchangers. But if you, if you follow your procedures, and if you guarantee that the conditions of the acid of temperature, pressure, concentration are inside your boundary limits, you will have problems like that only uh, if after a very long time you're running your plant. Uh, but then, but that you can be tracking each shutdown. You monitor every year or every two years. You monitor everything. You, you see how it is. You have some spare parts in case of a problem happens uh, the process goes uh, out of control so it is it is very part, very specific very very particular uh, depending on the age, the age of the plant as well okay uh, if you don't mind i will complete your answer okay bro yeah of course guys Go when on. we are talking about process that have, have flammable gases or toxic gases and we need to do maintenance and inspection. And if people want to get inside uh, equipment and etc., we need to shut down the plant. It means that all the equipments will be turned off. And usually we use some kind of inert gas to remove all the toxic or flammable gas that's inside the plant. So oh, okay. uh, if the, the, the employee will inspect a heat exchanger, we vent the gas that is inside there, we use an inert gas, we use analyzers to verify if the ambient is okay for entering. So we need a series of uh, process safety concerns before the, the employee can get inside our uh, equipment. So this is, uh, and all of this is included in the procedures that the Brunus uh, told us. Okay, so this is the, the main overview about the process of maintenance and inspections. Do you agree, Bruno? Yes, yes. Now I, I get more of the, the question. I was focusing more on operation, but now I get that our colleague was mentioning the safety aspects, right? Uh, personal safety, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, even uh, we clean everything, we, we purge uh, gases or things like this. And even, this, even doing this, we still have to use PPE when you go into equipment. So, and the PPEs are very, very like heavy ones that you, sometimes you have Tyvek or Tycanes and some very hot clothes. Uh, you you sweat a lot inside, but you, you have to take, uses masks in, in the company where I work, they had to use uh, masks because of uh, an eventual leak of uh, SO2. So we, we filters, masks with filters. So you always take a lot of, of you have to take care of this. And I have a question, another question here. In a usual procedure for corrosion inspection, uh, it's, inside, uh, it's inside the procedure that we just told. And I have a, a question from Jadon. Uh, can the SO2 released to atmosphere can be reused to produce CO2 to CO3 in converter? He's talking about I, the, the last the last absorber, right? Yeah, yeah. So I have I have read at the time I, I worked in this plant like two years ago. I have read some articles at the time about sending this this stack effluent to some kind of not a scrubber but but a, a, an equipment that would try to remove some of the SO2 and send the 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 gas the cleaned gas to the atmosphere but but those kinds of processes are are expensive i think if you can work more on efficient on your catalyst to uh, buy a better a better catalyst ensure that the life that the catalyst is still active you can guarantee that your so2 emissions are very very low because the process i, I was showing you guys is almost 100 percent conversion so the, this amount of SO2 that leaves to the atmosphere in normal conditions of the process, it is like 200, pp, 200 ppm 
I don't remember exactly exactly the numbers, but depending on the catalyst, you can have very very small quantities. And the environmental uh, uh, limits for the countries vary, but uh, mostly you are allowed to emit some of of the SO2. So uh, it's not like uh, you need to have like zero emissions, but very low emissions. Uh, and sometimes even this limit is a relative, uh, relative limit. It is from your production, for example, two kilos of SO2 for each ton of acid produced. So, you know, um, sometimes to make it goes to zero uh, is too expensive and you actually don't need to do this. Uh, it is not uh, mandatory. So... You, you always have those those analysis right because you want to to be more efficient efficient uh, but you also have to look at the cost of it and after you remove this so2 because probably you're going to use some solution some chemical to to react with this so2 how you're going to separate that to bring it back to the beginning of the system so probably it's not very economically feasible because of the quantity of so2 that leaves the the stack okay Okay, and we we have a question from Chandran. What pipe material are you using for the acid lines? Stainless steel or CL? CL, I don't know which kind of material is it. CL no. for me is chlor chlorine. Yeah, no, for, for the the concentrated acid, the the in the acid coolers, it is stainless steel. Okay. And o Javid, sorry, uh, yeah, Javid, does your plan to utilize predictive, predictive maintenance strategy for measuring performance? I, I believe that Javid is from the maintenance team, so they are very interested <laughs> about maintenance, right? And o, what was your experience related to the maintenance of the, the plant? You were the, anal, uh, chemi, uh, the analyst, you were the chemical engineer, you were involved with maintenance, uh, planning, schedule, how was it for you? Yeah, so about predictive maintenance, at the time, uh, in 2017, 2018, I don't remember specific predictive uh, maintenance uh, routines. Uh, we were more into preventive, so during shutdowns, we would do an inspection, but we don't, we, I don't remember if we had any kind of online monitoring, for example, of, of uh, something that would indicate corrosion directly in the equipment. Uh, I don't remember, but uh, regarding to maintenance, yeah, in a sulfuric acid plant, especially in, a, in the node plant, the plant where I worked, had almost 40 years old, was almost 40 years old. So maintenance problems, uh, failures were very, very common. And then you have to, to build a strong relationship with your maintenance peers. Uh, every day discuss about the issues. Uh, and I had to understand a little bit more about materials. I think that is, is one thing that I, I use it to talk a lot with the maintenance team to understand what kind of materials we were using uh, to understand corrosion rates, when we, uh, to understand the data from all the analysis that we did and all the inspections that we did in the shutdowns. So in the shutdowns, they would uh, uh, order some service, for example, of, of inspection in a heat exchanger. I would receive the, the report and I would have to take some decisions with them. Uh, we, we, we uh, I forgot the name in, maybe name in English, but sometimes the, some tubes are, are corroded and then you have to plug it. So, so to avoid worsening, worsening the, the problem. And when you have a lot of tubes corroded, sometimes you have to take a decision. So I substitute, I substitute the tubes or I just plug them and I keep with my operation going because the loss of heat, heat transfer will be neglectable we won't matter that much so some decisions we have to take in together most of decisions we had to take together and that's the interface i had with maintenance guys 
And, and Bruno, I, I have seen that your experience is most with operations. And yeah. uh, my expertise is plan design. So my, my life is with pipe instrumentation diagram, process simulation, uh, hitting material balance, and process data sheet for equipment, for instrumentation, for control valves. Uh, how much uh, this kind of stuff, you, you deal with this kind of stuff, how important is uh, an instrument that you see in, the, in your plant ha have a process data sheet or a specification data sheet? How do you, how your experience uh, from operations interface with the design of the company, documentation, etc. Oh, it is very important, very important. Especially when you you arrive at the plant, you start working in the plant. You have to to learn how it works and to understand the basis of the design. And for that, you have to look at your documents from design phase. So not only uh, PFDs, process flow diagrams, or PNIDs, process and instrumentation diagrams. You have to, to know those documents. You use, you use those documents all the time. And sometimes the company wants you to evaluate, for example, if you can increase your throughput, increase your capacity, do a revamp in your plant. You have to take a look at the design information. You have to understand, okay, the design uh, was predicting, was thought, the, the, the concept was to go until uh, that much of production. Uh, but how about my equipment? And then you have to look at the, the data sheet of your equipment. My, my equipments are designed to handle uh, more pressure or more flow or more temperature. So it is very important that you, at least you have the documents to understand the concept of your, your plant. And sometimes you are going to do a, a very high investment, for example, you are going to buy a new converter and you have to participate in the design phase, representing process and operations. So you are going to tell the project guy, okay, I need this production, my, my restrictions are this and this and this. Um, I would like to, you have to say to your, your project engineer what you want out of that project. So this contact is very important. And uh, I, I participated in the, the concept phase of a new converter to the plant that I was working. Uh, and I participated in the HazOps, for example. I, I could uh, check the, the documents that project engineers sent to me. So check the PFDs, check the PNIDs, check if, if uh, it was all right. Uh, I had meetings with the engineering company to align some information, to support them with some data. Sometimes they need they, they needed data from the plant to simulate some conditions in this in a software. So this contact is very important. Sometimes you have this this project team uh, or this this concept engineering team inside your company. In the company where I work today, for example, the technology is, is, is from this company. So I have those people inside the company. Sometimes, sometimes you don't. You hire a company, an engineering company, and then you have a close contact with them to send the information. Uh, that that I, I believe that is your work, right, uh, Jefferson, to be that engineering consultant that will come here, look at the plant, discuss the, the boundaries that the, the customer needs. So yes. something like this. And Bruno, I have a last question. Uh, and I, I have, in fact, I have two questions. I will get one from the chat and I have a, another one from my questionnaire. And okay. the question is, what is the life of the catalyst used? How often do you renew it? Do you know, depends on the, the supplier? How is it? Mm, actually, it depends on the, the bed you were talking about because you have different recipes from one bed to the other. In one bed, the first bed, for example, you have a lot of SO2 and almost no SO3 because you are receiving your fresh raw material. In the last beds, you are very saturated in product. So you, you need some different characteristics. The temperature is different in, in that bed. Uh, so it really depends. Uh, I could say that the bed that suffers the most is the first one. 
So if I'm not mistaken, each two years, it was not every year, I think it, it was every two years, you would have to do a screening to remove all the catalysts, uh, see what is broken and what is not, and then uh, make up for the, the catalyst loss that you have. Why the first one suffer the most? Because it receives a very high uh, load. Uh, the, the pressure uh, over the bed is very high. And so this catalyst can, uh, if you shut down and, and start up a lot of times, it can break mm -hmm. and generate a lot of dust. Also, the, the activity with time, inevitably, it will start to decrease. Then you have to track this all the time. Uh, each shutdown, you, normally you receive uh, a company that is uh, the supplier. It, it takes some samples of the catalyst, sent to a lab, analyze the activity, uh, return to you. Also, I didn't mention, but we, we measure delta P, uh, pressure drop over the beds, all the four of them, to check if, because if the pressure drop increases a lot, it means that you have a lot of powder in the gas is, is it is harder for the gas to pass through the bed. So that is also one thing that helps you Im uh, at least uh, imagine which, uh, how is the lifetime of your catalyst. So it's not only a matter of lifetime in terms of activity, but also in terms of the shape, if it is broken, if it has a lot of, of part of, um, if it, yeah, if it is broken. So things like this. But I, I'm not sure. I, I think I remember that the first, the, the fourth bed and the third, for example, you can stay a lot of years without changing it. But the first one, uh, it, it, is, it is the one that suffers the most. It is exposed to higher temperatures because you have more conversion there. So something like this. And to get a question from my questionnaire. It is the second time that you are having an internet experience, an online experience, it seems so. Yeah. You already were interviewed by my dear friend, the chemical engineering guy, Emmanuel Ortega. And I would like to, to know from you, what do you think about this exposure in the internet? Do you see any kind of benefits to your career? How, how do you think about that? Yes. Uh... It is, everything is, is very, this is very new for me because I think three months ago or, or five months ago, I, I recorded with, with Emmanuel and it was just new. It was very, inter it was very interesting. Uh, it was not something that I planned. Uh, the opportunity just appeared. I really like to, to talk in public, to, to, I really like communication, but actually I see more of those opportunities as uh, moments for us to motivate students to pursue an, in, an industrial career. I think in the universities, sometimes we are not uh, stimulated to go into that direction. At least here in Brazil, what I, I saw was that because most of the professors were looking into academia, research. Uh, so if you sometimes you pass your whole uh, graduation without knowing how it is to be in a plant, how things are uh, for real, and the size of things, the, the, the appearance of some equipments in real life. So I see the, those opportunities as a, a kind of, uh, maybe if I was a student right now, I would really like to find content like this online to motivate me to go through the hard years of, of the university in and to look for positions in the industry. Uh, so I see as a, but for my career, it's, it's good for me to, to build network. I really like to get to know people from, from the industry, colleagues from chemical engineering, people from other countries. I really like that as well. Uh, and yeah, I think it's advantageous for me to get to know new people. But the, the most gratifying thing for me, the most, uh, I'm happy to be stimulating, stimulating new students, stimulating students to go into that career, that career to see how nice it is to work in the, in the plant. That's very, very nice. And thanks a lot for being with me here today. We are Thank almost you. two hours speaking. It is the longest one, but not, <laughs> uh, not, uh, uh, how can I say that? But it is very interesting. So I didn't uh, feel the time pass on. It was very, very nice. And for sure that 
Uh, if you were not an uh, interviewer of the Emmanuel, I would probably I would never invite you to be here with me today. <laughs> Although yeah. you have a lot of achievements, I will I wouldn't wouldn't know that. And I believe that guys and talk to Bruno and talk to who is here to us. If you have the opportunity to to show the achievements that you have, the the knowledge that you have. Uh, take this opportunity to share it in a in a practical way, in a, in, a be, in in the benefits of others. Because when you benefit others, you there are a lot of people that will eventually benefit you. So, Bruno, uh, once again, thanks a lot. And I would like to ask you uh, your final words or your final message for those ones that wants to start a career as a chemical process engineer and after that you are free to to go okay okay first of all thanks for the opportunity it was very a very pleasant experience really uh, very good for a saturday morning here in brazil for us yeah. to discuss technology to discuss some processes discuss chemical engineering i'm very happy with the invitation thank you jefferson uh and giving some final words to, to chemical engineering students or someone that is interested in chemical engineering, go on with that. It's a very complex, it's not easy. It is, it is a complex field of study, but it is very exciting. You learn new things all the time, every day. Uh, you, you learn technical stuff, but you also learn a lot on soft skills. So you use your communication skills, you use your interpersonal relations uh, skills. So I really, I'm, I'm, I love the, this career. I'm very happy with what I do. And I believe that there are opportunities for, if you like challenges, if you like chemistry, if you feel like physics, mathematics, but also if you want to be in a very challenging environment, in a, uh, if you have the opportunity to go to meet a plant, to visit a plant, then you will have this feeling of, of being in a plant and to see how, how it works 24 hours a day, problems all the time for you to solve. So I really encourage this. I really encourage everyone that that likes it, that seems that, that thinks that, that it is interesting to pursue this career. And uh, if you don't know how it is, give it a shot, try it, uh, visit a plant before you take decisions. A decision to, for example, end your uh, engineer, chemical engineering graduation and go to a, a total different uh, field. I think give it a try, the industry and. Uh, probably you won't be disappointed. So thanks for, for your time, Jefferson. Thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to be here with you guys today. Thanks, Bruno. So this is it, guys. I hope you like it. I really uh, encourage you to take a look in the podcast of Bruno with the chemical engineering guy. And we see you soon in the next live session. Bye-bye, Bruno. Bye.